Having some issues with your desktop CNC? Then stick around and we'll be working through those in this episode. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel and love CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button to get all the latest videos. In today's episode, we're gonna be taking a look at the top 10 issues I often see people facing with these desktop CNC machines. We're talking about things such as, why can I not get my machine to connect? Why do I keep breaking bits? Why do my axis keep jamming? What I'll do is list the top 10 things we're gonna to cover today in the description area below with timestamps next to them in case you wanna jump ahead to a certain problem. Do check the description area out. It's where I'll put all the useful information from the video, any links that are relevant and various ways you can help out the channel if you're interested. Now the solutions that we're going to be giving today typically cover like you know 95% of the people that I've been helping out. There are always the exceptions where it usually is an actual fault with the machine or a fault with um, you know the software or something like that. So it may not solve it for everybody, but it should solve it for the majority of the people watching this video. So with that out of the way, let's get on with our first issue, which is why does my spindle not spin or why is my spindle not turning on? We'll move over to the PC and I will quickly show you the solution for that one. 99% of the people that experience this issue are using easel and what they don't realize is by default easel will set your spindle control to manual. Now the difference is manual control is for those people who use something like a standalone router such as a Dewalt or a Makita router in their machine where you have to turn it on either via turning the spindle on on the switch or via a plug something similar to that. Now obviously our spindle is part of the machine and we want the g-code to actually turn the machine on for us and get the spindle going. So what we need to do is come up to machine, come down to advanced, spindle control option will appear and then we change manual to automatic now for the default rpm obviously the standard spindle runs at around 9 to 10,000 rpm so you can put that in there unless you've got something like a 20,000 spindle either way put in whatever value suits your spindle once you've set that click x and that is it next time you export the g-code or use easel to run your machine the spindle should start up so the next question is why do my bits keep breaking? Now there are kind of two halves to this answer. If you're buying cheaper quality bits, they are going to break much easier because the quality of the material is going to be lower. Also the fact if you are buying very fine bits like these, you know, 0.8 millimeters, they're quite fragile. So they, they will break fairly easy if you push them too hard. And that actually leads me on to the more common reason that you break bits is people who are just starting out often go too fast, too deep or a combination of the both it puts too much pressure on the bit and that's essentially what causes it to break now people always ask is there a calculator or are there a guide to work out my feeds and speeds for machines such as these which are quite small and low powered none really exist that are that accurate and the reason being is because there are too many variations between the spindles the types of material and the types of bits that you'll use so my best advice is always start out slow start out shallow, do test cuts and build up from there. You will quickly start to understand what your machine is capable of and the bits that you're using with just by using some off cuts and doing those test cuts. Keep a note of what, what speed you're getting up to and as I say, start slow, build up and that way you should avoid breaking too many bits. Naturally, as part of the process, you know, a beginner will always break some bits. I always consider it some sort of initiation into the desktop CNC world. It's part of the process. But as I say, start slow, start shallow and build up. The next question is, why is my design missing detail? I often get sent a screenshot of a design that's got lots of detail and then a visualization that's missing most of that detail. Now, the reason for this is the bit that is being selected to do the cutting is too large to do that fine detail. For example, if you're using something like quite a, a lightweight font, but the bit that you've selected to do that cutting is something like a 1 8 flat end mill, it's a bit too heavy to complete all the fine detail in that font. To show you this clearer, I'll do a quick demonstration on the PC now, and we'll see what happens when we change between a fine bit and a thick bit, and the amount of detail that returns back to the image. So here is an example of what I mean. Now I'm doing this in easel, but the same principle applies to any software. I'm just using easel because it gives a good visualization of what's going on on the left versus the visualization on the right. 
Now, as we can see on the left hand side, we have the logo and there is big bold detail in these big filled out areas and then there is finer detail in the James Dean. Now over on the right hand side on the visualization, we can see the big areas are coming through and we've got these two blobs down here, but it's not filling in any of the text. Now the reason for that, the bit that we're using is a one eighth bit and a one eighth bit simply can't get in to make these smaller cuts. So in essence, it just ignores them and thinks that they're not there. So to get around this what we need to do is reduce the size of the bit. So if we bring this down to a 1 16th bit and come back out, we'll see that it's now added in the designs. It's also cleared, cleaned up some of the areas on the edge of this JD logo. And there's two little blobs over here but it's still not fine enough to pick up the James Dean text. So we'll drop this down again to a 1 32 bit. And now when we come out, we'll see it's picking up all of the detail because a 132 bit is fine enough to get in and make all these tighter cuts. Now, as simple as that sounds, the smaller the bit that you go down to, the longer a job will take to produce because essentially it's cutting a lot less area for every stroke that it does. Now, the way to get around this is to do something like a jewel cut or a rough cut with a detail cut. And what we essentially do is use a bigger bit to take out the mass material, and then we use the smaller bit to do the finishing detail. In easel, all we simply need to do is we'll put this back to a 1 8th bit for now. We'll click on the plus symbol next to it, and then we'll select the 1 32 bit to go in there. And what this now means is it's going to come in and do all the majority of the claims on the bigger boulder area with the 1 8th bit and then finish up with the finer detail of the 1 32 bit. Obviously you have to change your bit halfway through but what it does mean is that it saves trying to machine all of this area out with the smaller 1 32 bit. Now a question that I see or get asked almost on a weekly basis is why will my machine not connect to my computer? Now most of the time the person asking the question have just missed out one of the simple steps that you need to get everything connected whether it's connecting the USB cable correctly, installing the driver correctly or the correct settings in your software. Now I'll quickly run through this on the PC just to show the correct steps which usually resolves the problem for most of the people. So as I just mentioned, when most people say that they can't get their machine to connect with the computer, it's usually because they've missed a vital step in the setup process. Now the first thing to do is plug your USB cable into the machine. I'll do that now, we should hear a beep. The next step is we will need to install the driver. Now the driver for most of these GRBL machines is the same, however you should have had one come with your machine. You can always head over to your support site from whichever your manufacturer is and they should give you the option to download the driver. Now what I should say is if you are having issues with the driver, consider downloading it from a different source. For this today, I've put the driver on my desktop for us to use. So I'm simply gonna double click and open this up. You may not see this on screen, but I just need to click yes on a security message. And we'll present it with this screen. We simply want to click install and let it run through. It should just take a second. Now once the driver has installed successfully, we'll just close this down. And what we need to do is check that that is actually installed. To do that, we'll come down to the start menu and we will type device manager. As we see, it appears right here. We'll just click it. And from the device manager screen, we'll come down to ports and expand that menu. And what we'll see now is USB serial CH340COM5. Now, as you can see, that relates to the driver that we've just installed, CH340, CH340. COM5 is the important part that we need to now make a note of. So we'll just close that down. We'll now come over to our software that we're going to use to run the machine. So we'll open up UGS. Now from here, you need to make sure the board rate is 115200. Any other one may have issues connected. We'll then just refresh the port connection options and we'll drop this down. As we can see, we've got three, one and five. We know from just checking the device manager that the option we need is COM port five. So we'll select that now. Now we should just be able to click connect and everything should start talking to each other. Excellent, we can see that's loaded because it's just pulled in all the GRBL settings so we know it's all connected now. The jog controls have all come to life which is a great sign that everything is connected and working as it should.
Now if at this point you're still having connection issues, there are a few extra things to check. Make sure your offline controller is actually completely disconnected from the board. Also try different USB ports as well, as sometimes you can get USB ports that will work and others that may not be functioning as well. And whilst you don't necessarily need the power onto the control board, it does sometimes help just to ensure that the connection is going to be a bit more stable, so I'd consider turning that on if you haven't done so already. Axis keep jamming is the next issue that we're going to take a look at. I always get comments about my x-axis jams, my y-axis jams, how do I resolve it? Now usually the cause is that something has been missed during the initial build. It hasn't been aligned correctly and that's what causes things to jam. The jams also lead to missing steps when you're doing the design. So often people may say that things have slid wet in their design when it's machining and this is because steps have been missed as there's too much friction on one of the axes. Fortunately, it's a fairly easy solution to resolve this, just slackening off a couple of bolts, moving things about and realigning stuff. So we'll move over to the 3018 Pro and I'll show you how to do that now. So I'm just going to demonstrate this on the X axis, but the principle also applies to the Y axis. Obviously you just release these rails as opposed to these two rails. So we're going to drop the Allen key in place and we're just going to release this by about half a turn. And we're going to do that to the bottom one as well. With those loose, what we're going to do is slide the Z assembly all the way to the far end as far as it will go. So let's do this now, and we'll take it all the way over there. I'll speed this up a bit for you. Once it's far as it will go, we're then just going to pinch those bolts back up. Obviously, it's slightly more difficult me trying to do this in a time. But we'll just pinch that back up. And do the same for the top one. Now we're going to do exactly the same but over on the opposite side. So we're just going to come over, release this off by a little bit, maybe a little bit more than that. You just want to make sure that the rail can actually move. And we'll do the same on the bottom one as well. I'm just going to bring this all the way back over to this end now. Again, I'll speed it all up a bit for you. Now we're on to the, all the way at the other end, we're just going to tighten this back up. And your rail should be much better aligned now and minimise any jamming on either end of them. As I say, same principle applies to the X axis, um, to the Y axis as well. If you find that your Z axis is jamming, there's not really much movement on this. But when I've had this happen in the past, I've actually found it's all the build up that's happening in the thread. So just get in there with a, a tooth brush or a stiff wire brush or something and clean out all the gunk within the thread. Depth of cut is the next one. I often get asked the question, why is my design not machining to the correct depth that I set within the software? Now, there are a couple of things we can do to ensure accuracy up front, and then I'll move on to what is usually the root cause for most of the people that I talk to. So first, make sure you're using something like a Z probe to guarantee the best accuracy when you're setting the zero on your Z axis. There is a link in the corner now to either build your own Z probe or to be able to buy and install one and just show you how to set it up and as I say it just guarantees that when you start your job it's touching the top of the surface correctly. Next is calibration of axis and what I mean by this is when you tell one of your axis to move say 20 millimeters it actually moves 20 millimeters as opposed to 18, 19, 19 and a half. Techie DIY does a brilliant video about calibrating your axis. Link up in the corner now. Check out his channel. is is one of my inspirations for, for doing all the work on my machines. Now, what I want to move on to is the root cause for most people's issues. Often when people ask me this question, the first thing I say is what are you using to run your machine? And they respond by saying easel. Now easel is a fine piece of software for beginners for starting out doing design work. But the problem is easel has a known bug of adjusting one of the Z axis settings in your GRBL configuration. And what that often leads to is not getting the correct Z depth that you are aiming for. So what I always advise people to do if they want to continue using easel Use Easel to do the design, get everything that you want, but then export the G-code from Easel and use something like Candle or UGS to actually run your machine. Because as I say, with this known bug in Easel about it adjusting the settings, you've almost got to check the settings every single time before you run your machine to make sure it hasn't adjusted them. So the solution is, do the design in Easel, 
export from easel and then run it in candle or UGS just to minimize that risk. Now the next issue often comes in two questions with the same root cause. Why is my axis traveling the wrong way or why is my job coming out back to front mirrored, that type of thing. And as I say, the root cause is the same and it is that one of the axis is inverted. Now the solution is quite simple. We just need to change one of our GRBL settings to invert the axis the other way and get it running as it should. But before I show you how to do that, I just want to actually say, you need to know which way your axis should be running. Now, it sounds really obvious, I know, but there is usually one vital thing that people often miss with the 3018 machines. Now, when we're talking about jogging our machine around and the way the axis should be traveling, you have to imagine it that it's the spindle that we're moving all of the time. On a 4040 or something like that, it's fairly simple because left goes left, right goes right, forward moves it forward and backwards move it backwards. Now, with a 3018 style machine, because the bed moves, it kind of throws you off your thinking with your direction. So people often think that when they click forward, the bed should move forward. But if you imagine that's moving the spindle towards the back of the machine. So the correct way is when you click forward, the bed moves back and the spindle goes forward in relation to the bed and vice versa. So in essence, the front moves the bed backwards, the back moves the bed forwards. That is the correct way that the axis should run on a 3018 style machine. Now with that rambling explanation out of the way, let's move over and I'll show you how to actually change the setting that you need to in order to correct it. So if your axis is running the wrong way, we need to invert the direction that it is traveling. Now we can just invert one axis, we can invert two, or we can do all three at the same time if they are in fact all running in the wrong direction. Now if we come to our GRBL settings, obviously you can see mine here, to pull yours up, simply click in the command line, type dollar dollar and hit enter. Now the setting that we are looking for is number three, the dollar three, the step direction invert mask here. And this basically just allows the machine to invert the direction of certain steppers to get them going in the direction that we want. Now we can see at the moment mine is set at six. It can take different numbers and each number will invert a different stepper motor. To find out which one you need to change or the number you need to input, if you come over to Google and simply search GRBL settings. The first option that comes up should be this github.com, we'll click into that. And then we'll scroll all the way down until we can see the list of settings. And when we get to this $3 setting, we'll click on that and it will take us to the $3 option. If you scroll up slightly, what you will see is this table. Now this table gives us a list of numbers from zero to seven and each number has references as to what axis it will invert. Obviously, as you can see, zero will not change any of them. Number one will change just the X and so on all through the table. Now you need to know obviously which axis you need to invert. So let's say we need to invert the Y axis. We would look for the table where X and Z are both left the same, but the Y is changed. So in this scenario, number two is what we would need. If, for example, you needed to change both the Y and the Z axis, you would come down and find the one that you need. So here we have number six, X axis remains the same, Y will change and the Z will change. So that would be number six. Once you've figured out which number you need, just make a note of it, come back over to your control software, and then we simply type dollar three equals and then whatever number you need to be so let's say it needs to be number two so we'll press two hit enter and it's just loaded that in and then to double check simply type dollar dollar again and we'll scroll back up and now we should see dollar three equals two and that axis should now be inverted and run the correct way Next, we're gonna come back to depth, but with a slightly different issue. Now, I often see people cutting things out and saying like, it's cut on the left-hand side, but not all the way through on the right, or it's cut on the front, but not all the way through on the back. Now, the reason for this is something on your bed is not parallel with your gantry. So effectively, if that's your x-axis, like your bed is tilted one way or the other, it may be tilted in two directions. To solve this, what we need to do is install a spoil board, but not only that, we need to face that spoil board. And what that essentially means is taking a very thin top layer off the entire spoil board to get it perfectly flat and parallel with your x-axis gantry. Now I've got videos out for the 3018 and the um, 
4030XL. Links are in the corner if you want to follow those, but the principle is the same no matter what machine you're using. Get a piece of scrap material that is the size of your bed, whether that's MDF or chipboard, something like that. Fit it in place and then use something like a bottom cleaning bit to take a thin layer off the top area of everything. Make sure it covers every corner left to right, front to back. And once you've done that, things should be much more parallel with your axis and get perfect cuts on any side that you are attempting to cut on the bed. The next issue is work coming loose as you're machining. I always see people having issues where they're halfway through machining a job and the, the piece of material breaks free from the bed. Now, most of the time that this happens is because people are using the clamps incorrectly. There is a tendency to almost just clamp everything down. So if your material's in the middle, your clamps come down like that. The problem is the pressure is being applied diagonally, pushing your material away from your clamps. So if you imagine, obviously, this is your material and your clamp is coming down that way, as you're tightening the pressure, it's pushing your material out. So the correct way to clamp them is the plate should actually be perfectly flat on top of the material or even slightly inverted so it's pushing the pressure down into the material. And I'll put a picture up on screen, screen now of how it should actually be displayed. But also remember, there are alternative methods to holding everything down. If you've watched any of my previous videos, my favorite method is definitely blue tape and CA glue. What we essentially do with that method is put a layer of blue tape on the bottom of your material, a layer of blue tape on the top of your bed, a bit of super glue in between them and sandwich them together. And the friction that it gives just holds everything in place really well. And as I say, is my favorite method for holding things down. So why does my job keep cutting out halfway through? Now I've deliberately left this until last because it's one of the most complex issues to resolve. I haven't yet found one solution that solves it for everyone. There's often different reasons for this cutting out. So I'm going to talk through the different steps and hopefully one will solve the problem for you. Now, the first thing that you want to do is make sure you turn off all power saving settings on whatever device you're using to run your machine. Now, obviously, the power saving settings help minimize the, the power consumption when you're not moving the mouse and things like that. What it actually does though is also turns off things like the USB ports and stops the machine communicating with the PC or the laptop. So it is crucial you turn all of those off. It would take too much time to tell you every single setting, but if you just simply Google, turn power saving settings off on Windows 7, Windows 10, Windows 8, whatever it is that you're using, you should get all the answers that you need. Just pay attention if you've got Windows 10. I think on the latest version, they've moved one of the power saving settings elsewhere. So you may just need to go and hunt that particular one down. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about, if none of that works, take a look at your USB cable. Most of the USB cables provided this, with these machines are normally suitable. They're insulated and they have ferrites. Those are those little cylinders that go around your cable just to help any interference. But if you are using just a very thin, cheap cable, consider upgrading it to a better quality one. Now, I just touched on interference. That's also something you need to pay attention to. Make sure your USB cable isn't running next to any, any power lines, such as the power supply for the control board itself or the AC adapters and that type of thing. Obviously, the smallest amount of interference can just cause issues with the communication between the PC and the machine itself. Now, the next thing that you, you may want to try is earthing your control board. I I don't see many people doing this, but I did have an issue initially on my 3018 Pro and I did it and it did help a little bit. You just want to find a way to be able to earth your control board. And again, it just can minimize the risk of something setting it off and stopping the job from continuing. So I'm just jumping in here. As you can see from the screen behind me, I'm actually editing the video you're watching now. And what I've realized is before the final step that I'm about to talk about, there was something I actually left out. Now you can consider trying a USB hub at this point. A USB hub essentially has its power supply from a separate adapter or plug and therefore it can kind of help boost the connection if that makes sense because it's not always trying to draw the power from the machine itself and therefore can just be a bit more stable than using the USB directly plugged into your laptop or PC. If you're not sure what a USB hub is I'll put a link to one on Amazon below in the description area but for now let's get back to the main video. Unfortunately, if all of those have failed, and when I've spoke to people in the past and they have failed, usually all the people that get this far and still haven't resolved the issue are using laptops. Now, I don't know what it is about the, the power delivery or the USB ports in laptops, but it seems to 
deliver it differently than it does on PCs. And the only other solution once you get to that point is try and borrow another laptop from somebody else, try and use a desktop PC if you can, or consider changing altogether. So I, I had a lot of issues with this when I first had my 3018 Pro. As soon as I switched to a desktop machine, it got rid of it all. So yeah, if you are struggling and you've got to this point and you've tried everything else, do consider switching what device you are using to control your machine. Now, in saying all of that, this is on the assumption that your computer is actually losing connection with the machine itself. There are the occasions where your, your G code that you're running may just have a bad piece of G code and that's what's causing it to stop. If it's always stopping at the same point, there's a good chance it is that, um, you know, and it is just one thing to keep an eye on. Go back through the, the log of where the G code is running and it usually flags if there is an error. So there we have it, top 10 issues and solutions to go with them. Hopefully they've solved your problems. If not, do comment down below and I'll do my best to help you because I do a lot of working through solutions and it also means I can then make another video to help everybody else out. Now, if you did enjoy today's video, as always, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you want to consider helping out the channel, check out the links in the description area below. That is everything for today's episode. I'll see you all on the next one.